Where is God's grace to the seven churches in the book of Revelation? These are very sobering messages from our Lord for today's church, the church of the 21st century. Here, we want to give solid food for radical disciples. If you'd like to have the video playlist of all of these sessions for radical disciples, as well as the accompanying PowerPoint presentation slides for each session, just email us at Elijah003 at gmail.com, or you can WhatsApp me at plus one two eight one five zero seven eight five one seven. Uh, later during the session, I will give you this contact information again. So if you'd like to have it, just get your mobile phone ready and you can take the picture. Now, this is what our Lord Jesus declared. John 12, verse 50, Jesus said, I know that his command, meaning his Father's command, leads to eternal life. So, Whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Now, does what Jesus said here apply to us disciples as well? Well, I would say so, yes. Therefore, obeying the Father's command leads to eternal life. Obedience for a disciple is not optional. Well, let me share with you some headline news here in the United States. There is now a revival taking place. It's taking place at a university called Asbury. And this revival took place 24 hours a day. It took place over a period of 13 days consecutively, 24 hours a day. And 50,000 people flocked to this town to take part in this revival. Okay, praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to turn on the sound and then I'm going to play this video, okay? This is what took place at Asbury University in Kentucky. 24 hours a day over a period of 13 days. So we call this revival. Okay, revival is very good. Now, after this revival, then what? You see the revival taking place in church where people are worshiping the Lord 24 hours a day for 13 straight days, okay? So after this revival, then what? Well, one of the vice presidents at this university said the following, Jesus calls us to go out. So now that we have come in and received amazing filling up, meaning filling up of the Holy Spirit, it's truly time to go out and share the gospel and carry the light and fire into our local communities, our local homes, our local churches, schools, and workplaces. And allow me to add, to those at the ends of the earth who never heard. That's what my wife and I did after we experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. At first, I went to the streets of our community with my bullhorn preaching the gospel. But then, eventually, the Lord led us to go to the ends of the earth to proclaim the kingdom of God to those who never heard. Acts 1, verse 8, Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. 
where? In Jerusalem, in your hometown, and in all Judea and Samaria throughout your state, and even to the ends of the earth. So revival should not lead to our being witnesses, not only in our local community, but to the ends of the earth. Now, for today's teaching, Ephesians 2, verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now, this refers to grace for salvation through faith and not by the works of the law. Now, true saving faith, however, will result in obedience to God's holy commands. If you have faith that truly saves you, it will result in obeying the Lord. Let me repeat Ephesians 2 verse 8 one more time. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now, the works referred to here, of course, are the works of the law of Moses as prescribed in the Old Testament. We are not saved by legalistic obedience to the requirements of the law of Moses. I believe that is very clear. However, Paul is not teaching that deeds of obedience to the Lord's commands are unnecessary in the life of a born-again believer. He is not saying that. Let's see what James makes abundantly clear in his epistle. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Show me your faith without deeds. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. You foolish person, you fool, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac at Mount Moriah? He was considered righteous for what he did, his willingness to sacrifice Isaac. You see that Abraham's faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. And what they do is a result of true saving faith. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So we see James teaching that faith in Jesus without deeds and obedience to his commands, is useless. It cannot save. Such so-called faith without deeds is dead. The Holy Spirit, whom we receive when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior sincerely from our heart, will teach and will enable us to carry out the Lord's holy commands. The Holy Spirit teaches us and enables us to obey the Lord's commands. That is God's grace. The Holy Spirit, the one who indwells us after we believe in Jesus, he's the one who teaches us and enables us to carry out the Lord's commands. That is God's grace. 
only after I received the Holy Spirit in 1977 was I enabled to leave everything in America, to give up the American dream, and to go to the jungles of Indonesia to proclaim the kingdom of God to those who never heard. That is God's grace, totally. Let us now examine what kind of deeds of obedience the Lord required from the seven churches of Revelation. What kind of obedience, what kind of deeds did Jesus require of them to show their faith, true saving faith, the kind of genuine faith which takes them to the eternal kingdom of God above? God's grace in these very last days. Let's take a look. Today, many of us servants of God, I'm referring to us pastors, in an effort to distance ourselves from the legalistic works of the law, we studiously avoid, quote, ministering condemnation, unquote, to God's people. We don't want to make them feel bad. And so we concentrate almost totally on what we call the free gift of God's grace, while often purposely avoiding the mention of the words obedience and deeds. We pastors, we like to concentrate on grace. It's free. God's love is free. Jesus paid the price when he died on the cross. It's free. And so often we end up avoiding terms like obedience, and good deeds, and good works. Not a few churches have in their names the word grace. In fact, I myself, I once planted and pastored a church called Grace Community Fellowship of Houston. And before that, before I planted Grace Community Fellowship, I served in a church called Grace Chapel. Do you know of any church called Good Deeds Church? How about Obedience Methodist Church? Or Good Works Baptist Church? Have you heard of any churches with names like that? And the answer is absolutely not. In the church today, our focus is nearly entirely on the free gift of salvation by grace through faith. And at the same time, we minimize the good deeds and works which should be evident in our lives as a result of true saving faith. We minimize the good deeds, the good works. Good works is almost like a dirty word in yeah, current Christian theology. Now, many believers feel that we are now on the very cusp of the second coming of the Messiah. We're in the very last days. So let's take a look at the book of Revelation to understand better what is happening. The book of Revelation is the very last book in the Bible. So let's take a look to see what's going to happen during these very last days. We will focus on Jesus's words to the seven churches in chapters two and three, in order to understand the real role of grace in the church during these very last days before the great and terrible day of the Lord. These words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we're going to study in a moment, apply to us in the church today. Our Messiah Jesus declared, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In Revelation 1, Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, 
and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So let us take very seriously the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. His words will never pass away. Let's look at his words to the seven churches in Revelation. Let's read the words of our Messiah to these seven churches. Our Messiah is the one who suffered as no man has ever suffered. He is the one who was obedient to the Father unto death. And he did it for the hope of eternal life for all whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, let's look at his message to the angel of the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and you have found them to be false, false apostles. Now, as stated earlier, in the church today, grace is usually stressed in contradiction contradistinction to works. But the type of grace we often hear about today in church is not evident in these words of the Lord to the church in Ephesus. No, instead, Jesus commends them for their deeds, for their hard work, and for their perseverance. Jesus does not mention their faith, no. But instead, he mentions deeds, hard work, your perseverance. Now let's go on to verse 3 in his message to this church in Ephesus. You have persevered. You have endured hardships for my name. And you have not grown weary. And so the Lord commends them for their perseverance and for continuing to endure hardships for his name. He commends them for these things. There is no mention of their faith. Instead, he talks about hard work, perseverance, hardships. He doesn't talk about their faith. By the way, there is also no mention of earthly blessings in his words to this church. He didn't say God loves you and God is going to bless you. No. Rather, he talks about perseverance, hard work, enduring hardships. But after this praise and commendation comes a harsh rebuke from our Lord Jesus. Verse 4, yet, Jesus says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Do the works you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, whatever that means, we do not want that to happen. This is a very harsh rebuke from our Messiah Jesus for this church. Very harsh. Now, let me repeat verse 4. 
you have forsaken the love you had at first for me. You have forsaken it. Now, what kind of love did they have at first? What kind of love? Well, as a possible example, look at the following, which I showed you last week. Look at the love that these early disciples had for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what they did. They were willing to be torn apart and eaten alive by lions. They were willing to be put on a cross and burned alive. That was their extent of their love for the Lord. Now, how many Christians today love Jesus so much that they would be willing to do the same thing? How many? Many or few? Think about this. Our Lord Jesus commanded them to repent and to do the things you did at first. He's talking about good works, perseverance. Jesus threatens to remove their lampstand from its place if they do not do the good deeds they used to do. Because of the love they had for him at first. This is a very harsh warning. Not many ministers today would dare preach such a message of apparent condemnation on a Sunday. You see, this, is, this kind of message would be considered condemnation if you preach it on a Sunday morning. You're making people feel bad. Well, this is what Jesus said to this church. Today, instead, we hear mostly about God's love and God's grace and how much he wants to bless us and our families here on earth in this life. That's why some churches get so big. But scripture does not focus on such blessings in this life. That is not the focus of the scripture. Rather, Scripture prepares us for the real life, which is to come in the next stage for his beloved people. That's the primary focus of Scripture. Not this life, but the next life. But we in the God-blessed Christian West, we are not so focused on heaven, no. But we focus on what God can do for us here and now in this life. We want, our, we want to enjoy our pie in this life and in heaven as well. We want to focus on how God can help us to fulfill the American dream for here, for believers who live in America. It appears that this is about to change. If you look what is happening to the culture in the West in America, it looks like this is about to change. In the next verse, Jesus commends them for something which few believers are aware of today. Let's look at the next verse. But you have this in your favor. Hmm. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You believers in Ephesus, you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So here Jesus relents a bit by commending them for their hating the practices of the Nicolaitans, which he hates. Now, what are the practices of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates? What are they? If Jesus hates them, we must seek to understand what they are. It will be in our favor to hate their practices. 
Only twice in the New Testament is it recorded that Jesus hated something. The first instance, Hebrews 1, verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. That's the first instance. And also the second instance to the church at Ephesus. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Later, we will scrutinize these practices hated by Jesus to understand what they might mean and how we should also hate and avoid them. But for now, we can conclude that the popular message of grace heard today is not present in the Lord's message to the church at Ephesus. No, we do not see it. Revelation 2, verse 7, Jesus says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have ears? Well, then you must hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. It is essential that we disciples be victorious. What does it mean for us to be victorious? What does it mean? We shall see. Let's look at what Jesus said to the angel of the church in Smyrna. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and who came to life again. I believe sometimes the Lord uses angels to speak to us, to teach us. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions. I know your poverty. Yet you are rich. This is not the kind of prosperity which is taught in not a few churches today. <laughs> Most churches today do not talk about afflictions and poverty which Christians must undergo. <laughs> but Jesus did focus on the afflictions and the poverty of the believers in the church in Smyrna. And Jesus said, yet you are rich. In my eyes, you are rich. Now, Jesus continues with, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer, suffer. Then Jesus tells them that they are going to suffer. Definitely not a typical prosperity message that you hear in many churches today. Instead, Jesus tells them they are going to suffer. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. There is no hint of rebuke in the Lord's message to this church in Smyrna. No rebuke at all, but just commending them. There is no rebuke in this message, no hint of rebuke to these who are going to suffer persecution. The church in Smyrna is only one of Two of the seven churches in Revelation, which Jesus does not rebuke and command to repent. 
Only two of the seven, he commends. And the church at Smyrna is one of them. He commends them for their afflictions and for their poverty. A message we don't hear in many churches today. If there's a poor person in our church, we say, well, obviously you're not giving your tithe. God hasn't blessed you. That's probably what we would hear. Then Jesus informs them that they are going to suffer persecution for 10 days. You're not going to hear that in most churches, even to the point of death for his name's sake. How often do you hear that in a church in America? This took place in Japan centuries ago to the first believers in Japan. Then Jesus says to this praiseworthy church, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. That is what we are after. Not to be hurt at all by the second death. The first death, no problem, as long as we are not hurt by the second death. Again, it is essential that disciples be victorious. Because if you are victorious, you will not be hurt at all by the second death. What does victorious mean? We shall see. Hang on. The victorious will receive life as their victor's crown, including authority to reign with him in the next age. They will not be hurt at all by the second death. We note that even toward this very faithful church, Jesus' words did not smack of the grace we hear so often today. The grace for comfort, the grace for material prosperity, and the grace for effortless success in this life. There's a very well-known preacher in Singapore who likes to teach this. Rather, the grace on what Jesus focused was the grace to endure afflictions, the grace to endure poverty, the grace to endure slander, the grace to endure persecution, and the grace to even suffer death for the Lord's sake. That is grace resulting in life as their victor's crown. That is grace. That is the grace we see in Revelation 2 and 3. The grace to obey and the grace to endure to the very end, even unto death. Now, let's look at the words of the Lord Jesus to the angel in the church in Pergamum. I believe the Lord spoke to this church through his angel. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Ouch. I know where you live where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. I'm sure you must be familiar with this photo. It was taken 
a few years back where the Egyptian, these Egyptian Christians were martyred by ISIS for refusing to give up their faith in Isa, Isa al-Masih. Jesus commends these believers in Pergamum for not renouncing their faith in Jesus. Despite the martyrdom of Antipas in their city. Where Satan lives. But then Jesus said. Nevertheless. Even though you did not renounce your faith in, in me. When you saw Antipas martyred, yes, that is good. But nevertheless, I have a few things against you. <laughs> it was not enough that they did not give up their faith. Jesus had a few things against them. Despite their heroically not renouncing the Lord, Jesus brings up their shortcomings. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols, meaning idolatry, and committed sexual immorality. So, despite these believers in this church of Pergamum, not renouncing the Lord, even though they saw other believers sacrificed, martyred because of their faith. But there were some among these believers who held to the teaching of Balaam, which involved idolatry and sexual immorality. Despite their not renouncing Jesus in the days of Antipas, Jesus still would not overlook their faults, idolatry, and sexual immorality. Hmm. Jesus expected them to be pure in his sight. After all, he commanded them in Matthew 5, 48, to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And... With the help of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, we can aim for perfection. Yes, we can. And then the Lord goes on to rebuke them for still other sins. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which of course Jesus hates. Hmm. The church in Pergamum had believers who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, repent. Otherwise, I will come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus said that he will soon come and fight against those in this church who hold to the teaching of Balaam and also to the teaching of the Nicolaitans with the sword of his mouth. That is, with the word of God. Now, all of this does not sound at all like the message of God's love and grace we hear so often today on Sunday mornings on the radio. Will Jesus actually fulfill what he said? Will he fight against those who hold to these two teachings with the sword of his mouth? Will he? Yes. <laughs> Jesus will keep his word. So let's study these two teachings. The teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Let's start with the teaching of Balaam. Now, exactly what is the teaching of Balaam? That is, the eating of food sacrificed to idols as well as sexual immorality? Let's see. Let's take a look. Jude 1 verse 11. <clears throat> this will help us to understand. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. Now, 
You recall Balaam was a prophet and he had been paid to prophesy against Israel. Let's look into this. Second Peter 2.15, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer. Here, Peter is talking about believers in the church who have left the straight way. They've wandered away, and now they follow the way of Balaam. Balaam, who loved the wages of wickedness. Wages. Oh, wages. Okay. He loved the wages of wickedness, of sin. And then verse 17, Peter says, these people who have left the straight way and wander off to follow the way of Balaam, these people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. So therefore, I stay away from the way of Balaam who loved the wages of wickedness. I stay far, far away from the teaching of Balaam. Why? Because blackest darkness is reserved for those who leave the straight way and follow the way of Balaam. Peter here is talking about Christians, Christians who leave the straight way and wander off. Now, let's look at more information about Balaam, son of Bezer. King Balak, King Balak of Moab paid Balaam to prophesy curses on the Israelites in Numbers 22. Let's look at that. Numbers 22, verse 4. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messages to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. Balak said to Balaam, a people has come out of Egypt, talking about the Israelites who crossed the Red Sea into Canaan. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. And Balak said to Balaam, the prophet, now, Come and put a curse on these people, on these Israelites, because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left taking with them the fee for divination to give to Balaam, the for-profit prophet, who would prophesy against God's people Israel in order to satisfy his love of money and his greed. Again, 2 Peter 2.15, they have left the straight way. They have wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of wickedness. He was paid to put a curse on God's people. Balaam, the for-profit prophet, loved the wages of wickedness due to his greed. And according to Colossians 3, verse 5, greed is idolatry. Greed is the same as idolatry. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Therefore, for believers, if they have greed in their hearts, they are guilty of idolatry, of worshiping idols, of worshiping a false god. The teaching of Balaam, the for profit prophet, is therefore clearly greed. And today there are for profit prophets. 
there are prophets who will prophesy if you give them a good offering. The bigger your offering, the more they will prophesy over you, and they will prophesy blessings over you, of course. And what about the sexual immorality in the church at Pergamum? There were two things, right? There was the teaching of Balaam and also sexual immorality. In scripture, sexual immorality often refers to adultery, meaning being unfaithful to our one and only spouse. That's what sexual immorality often referred to, being unfaithful to our spouse. And being unfaithful to your one and only spouse represents being unfaithful to the Lord, the one and only true God. So being unfaithful to your spouse can represent being unfaithful to our one and only God, our Father in heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a relationship between adultery, sexual immorality, and being unfaithful to God. Being unfaithful to the Lord by worshiping a false God. That is idolatry. If you are unfaithful to the Lord by worshiping a false God, for example, greed, that is idolatry. So sexual immorality often refers to idolatry. Therefore, eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality can both refer to or symbolize idolatry, being unfaithful to God. Both of them can symbolize idolatry, which is being unfaithful to the Lord. Now, what is idolatry for believers today? For Christians in the church today, what is idolatry? Idolatry for believers today is primarily greed. Believers today generally do not worship actual idols in their homes, no. But the idol is in their heart. It is called greed. Therefore, the teaching of Balaam for believers today is greed. First John 2. Verse 16, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Lusting after the things of the world is idolatry and greed. Now, this church in Pergamum was commended for not renouncing their faith even during stressful times of persecution. But then we see Jesus rebuking this very same church for tolerating those who held to the teaching of Balaam. That is greed. Something which is related to prosperity teaching in the church today, which says, God loves you and wants to bless you materially. Prosperity teaching in the church today stirs up the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Oh, look at the wonderful life and possessions God has blessed me with. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As a result, we in the West, especially in America, we lose focus on the realm of eternity to come in the next stage. Instead, we focus on what God can do for me now. And so, the result is believers end up storing their treasure on earth instead of in heaven. Jesus also rebuked the church in Pergamum for holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. 
Revelation 2, verse 15. I repeat, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. He is speaking here to the angel of the church in Pergamum. You have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. In my view, the teaching of the Nicolaitans is primarily responsible for the weak and ineffective state of the church today. That is my understanding. Why is the church so weak and ineffective today? Why is it that in America, a so-called post, excuse me, a so-called Christian nation has now turned to idolatry? Wokeism has now turned to things that God hates. Why? In my view, it is because of the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And so Jesus commands the believers to repent. In future sessions, we will look at the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates in depth. So, where is God's grace in this message to the Pergamum church? Where is God's grace? Well, we find the grace of God in their enduring the horrible persecution they suffered. That is the grace of God. We find the grace of God in their not renouncing their faith during persecution. And even being threatened with death for their faith in Jesus. But they endured it. That is the grace of God at work in this church. The grace of God. The grace of God. They endured the persecution. Repeating verse 13 to the church in Pergamum, you did not renounce your faith in me. Not even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Jesus' message to the church in Pergamum contrasts sharply with the grace often taught today for enjoying abundant life here on earth. Rather, it was the grace not to renounce their faith in Jesus during great persecution and suffering. That is grace. Based on what we see taking place in the culture of the West today, especially in the culture in the United States, persecution of the church in the West is not far off. The mainstream culture in the United States hates the gospel, hates God, and hates born-again Christians. We do not see it yet in the mainstream press in the mainstream media but it is now coming out slowly little by little in the mainstream media hate for that which god created now god's grace in his message to the pergamum church is also evident in his rebuking them for holding to the teaching of the nicolaitans he is correcting them correcting them for holding to this horrible teaching. That is God's grace. When God disciplines us, that is God's grace. The Lord is giving them the grace to repent from holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. That is God's grace. The grace to repent. Finally, to the church in Pergamum. Jesus says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. Later, we will see what it means to be victorious. Jesus says, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Next week, Jesus' message to the angel of the church in Thyatira. 
next week we will learn about what it means for a disciple to be victorious. If you'd like to have the video playlist of all of these sessions given to Radical Disciples, along with the PowerPoint presentations, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com or WhatsApp me at plus one two eight one five zero seven eight five one seven. Now, during the time remaining, I'm going to share from Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, our missionary adventures in West Borneo, West Kalimantan, in Indonesia over nine years. If you missed our earlier sharing, or you'd like to have the file of Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, just email us at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Uh, by the way, our dear sister Pola Muzika, Christian film producer, she's told me that she has made great progress on writing the script of the pilot episode of the TV series, which will be based on the book Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. Perhaps Paula can share a bit more about that later so that we can pray for her as she writes the script. Now, 1986, these are our two daughters at that time, Sarah on the left and Esther on the right. Our third child, our third baby, Christina, was not yet born. Of course, these two are now adults, all grown up. Uh, Esther is already over 40 years old. And I had to homeschool Esther. I was her teacher for one year. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to share with you. Some of you probably don't know what this is. Many of you do. If you're a bit older, you know what this is. This is a typewriter, which no one uses anymore. 40 years ago, if I, write, if I wanted to communicate with people back home in the US, if I wanted to write a letter to the church which, which was supporting us in New Jersey, I had to sit down at my trusty Smith Corona typewriter and I had to type out a letter. Okay, and then after typing out the letter, I would fold it and put it in an envelope. And then somehow I would have to get the letter to Pontianak where there was a post office. In Batuwampad where we lived, there was no post office. And so somehow we had to find a way to get the letter all the way up north to the city of Pontianak to be taken to the post office and then to be sent. Typically, about a month later, I would receive a response from the church in New Jersey, which was supporting us. Okay, So it would take about a month to communicate with people back home. Now, fast forward 40 years. Today, if we want to communicate, if we want to talk to people in Batuampad, we simply have to press a button on our cell phone, and within seconds, we can talk to a believer, a leader in Indonesia, in Pontianak, in Batu Ampad. It is actually unbelievable what has taken place in the area of technology in just 40 years. Before it took a month, now it takes seconds. I still have this typewriter, by the way. <laughs> now, let me share with you a testimony here. Okay. There you see a Siu and a Gong. A Siu is seated, a Gong is standing behind her. They took the gospel about five miles or eight kilometers into the interior of Batu Ampad with the objective of sharing the gospel with an elderly ethnic Chinese woman who was the influential matriarch of a very large clan of Chinese people. And we all called her grandmother. We called her Apa, Apa, grandmother. And there you see grandmother in church. Grandmother was nearly, nearing 80 years old, and four generations of offspring really honored her. Although a grandson and a few others had already made Jesus Christ their Lord, most of the other family members did not dare to follow them. 
they had heard about the name of Jesus through the ministry of our workers. But unless grandmother took the first step, they would not commit themselves to Jesus. In Chinese culture and behavior, doing that which honors one's family, one's elders, and one's ancestors is a singular driving force. And so, a Gong and us, you visited grandmother on a few more occasions. And while she received them cordially, she would not forsake her strict Buddhist beliefs. For about 15 years, grandmother had not eaten meat. Grandmother was a rare example of exceptional faithfulness to Buddhism, and she was not about to throw away all her merit and good works for what we call faith. But one night, grandmother had a dream. In this green dream, grandmother saw herself standing on a beach. A ship appeared on which she saw many people beckoning to her, and she could identify them as her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. They were all on the boat, experiencing great joy and well-being on the ship, and they were calling her to join them. There was a man in a white robe on the ship who let down a rope to pull her up. Guess who that was? <laughs> well, in her dream, grandmother hesitated to grab hold of the rope. The ship subsequently sailed off into the distance. Then grandmother woke up, regret lingering in her heart, because she had been left behind. Shortly after grandmother's dream, Lucille and I paid a visit to her. At that time, she was living with her grandson, who, with his wife, operated one of the variety stores owned by the family. They had a teenage daughter named Asyong. As we sat with grandmother in the back section of the store, which was set aside for living quarters, grandmother related her dream to us. And what she saw was not difficult to interpret for her. God had prepared grandmother's heart that she might believe the gospel and enter the kingdom of God. That is grace. Her name and the names of her entire clan have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the creation of the world. And so we interpreted her dream for her. We told her the ship in her dream represented an ark of salvation similar to Noah's. And just as God wanted to save Noah's entire family, so he wanted to save grandmother's whole family. Her family, already on board the ark, was already enjoying God's salvation and wanted grandmother to receive eternal life as well. We explained to grandmother that God had already provided the way for her to climb aboard the ship. The white-robed man in the dream was the Savior, the Messiah Jesus, who by his atoning death on the cross would lift her up to the ship of salvation from the waters of sin and death. And not only that, Jesus himself was the ship. He was the ark of eternal life. He is not only the way and the truth, but also the life as well. And then grandmother asked us, and so what must I do to climb aboard this ship to be with my family? What should I do? I smiled and I answered, Grandmother, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. I smiled at God's marvelous ways. Grandmother said, I want to believe in Jesus. And by her sincere faith, Grandmother received the perfect righteousness that she had been working so hard to earn by not eating meat. Later, on the day of her baptism, Grandmother showed her ingenuous eagerness to receive total forgiveness of her sins. Let me share with you what I mean. Now, in order to baptize her, we were using a small dirt well about five feet deep, dug out of the ground in her son's front yard. 
it was actually a well from which the family got their water for washing purposes. And we were going to use it to baptize grandmother. So let me describe to you how grandmother was baptized. First, I went down into the four foot diameter well. And then grandmother went down after me, helped by her son and daughter-in-law who were there to witness the baptism. I gave her some brief instructions to squat down into the water for baptism by immersion. Then I plunged her into the muddy water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I then promptly tugged on her gently so that she could stand up and emerge from the water. After all, she was a frail 80-year-old who might not be able to hold her breath for too long. But when I tugged on her, I felt resistance. She did not come up. Quickly, I tried to pull her up, but grandmother remained squat and anchored in the water. I became concerned, concerned that her baptism would not only symbolize spiritual salvation, but also result in physical death by drowning as well. And so I said sharply, grandmother, come up now. I thanked the Lord when grandmother finally emerged. I asked her, why didn't you come up out of the water sooner, grandmother? Her answer brought smiles and laughter to everyone there. She said, I stayed in the water a long time because I wanted all my sins to be washed away. Grandmother's daughter-in-law had prepared a meal for everyone after the baptism. The menu included meat. In normal circumstances, grandmother had special vegetarian food prepared for her because of her Buddhist beliefs. But now she was a follower of Jesus Christ, saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Since she was already declared perfectly righteous by her faith in Christ, grandmother was now free to eat whatever she wanted. Her daughter-in-law had prepared, among other things, a dish of mouth-watering pork for us. The tantalizing smell of the pork, the aroma which grandmother had not permitted herself to enjoy for 15 long years, was simply too much for her to resist. Grandmother said to me, Pastor, now that I'm a believer, I can eat what I want as long as I'm thankful for it, right? Even pork? And I said, that's right, grandmother. But you haven't eaten meat for so many years now. Do you think your stomach can take it? You don't want to get sick. Grandmother answered me, well, I'll just start with a small portion, Pastor. And so we gave thanks to the Lord and we ate. Grandmother ate and ate and she ate, but she suffered no ill effects. By faith, she ate heartily that afternoon and enjoyed God's provision. Grandmother's faith in the Lord grew. The most compelling proof of her faith was her earnest desire to worship God and partake of his word. There were good deeds. <laughs> there was obedience. This frail 80-year-old lived with her grandson perhaps five miles, maybe eight kilometers from our house in Batuambad, where we held our Sunday services. Yet, week after week, grandmother showed up for church every Sunday. <clears throat> she always sat in the same place at the front of the sanctuary, beaming radiantly as she heard the word of the Lord. You can see her there. And grandmother negotiated the entire 16-kilometer or 10-mile round trip on foot. Because of her faith. The entire clan came to know and serve Jesus Christ. In time, among her grandchildren and great-grandchildren were counted very committed and successful business people who would become a great blessing to the gospel in West Kalimantan in Borneo, even to us here in the United States. Her great-granddaughter, Asyong, would eventually be given a very powerful gift of prophecy by the Lord spoke, by which the Lord spoke even to us here in America. 
There you see a cell group in the interior with grandmother's grandson, Ameng, as the cell group leader, Ameng, her, her grandson. Now, next week, when we share about our adventures on the mission field in Indonesia, I'm going to share about our power encounter with a witch doctor. Now, this is only a stock photo, but next week, I'm going to share with you a very dramatic, powerful encounter we had with a witch doctor, a powerful witch doctor in Indonesia. So, come back next week. This narration was taken from Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, our book. If you'd like to have it, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us today. See you next week.